Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Here to this house today, amen. And we're so glad for everyone that's here. If you're a guest here today, thank you for being with us. Amen, amen, amen. If you could turn with me this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. As you're turning there, if you're not familiar with our schedule, Man, this first session, we have classes going all over this campus for try to be every age group, amen. And when we pray in a minute, we're going to pray that God blesses every class, amen. So this first session in here, I'll be teaching until about 1050, and then everyone will gather in here. We're just going to have a good time of worship and preaching and just see what God will do, amen. I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen. Genesis chapter 2, and then Sister Leah after that. I apologize. I should have told you we're going to go to John chapter 7. Genesis 2. And the river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Uh, many other versions, if you look at it, that last portion says it became four rivers. And... Uh, you got the Premier Study Bible. It says these came four heads of rivers. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is bedlam and onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hittichel, that is, it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And if you'd like to turn there, John chapter 7, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 37, very familiar portion of Scripture. It says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And if you can set your Bible down this morning, let's just pray that God would speak to our hearts in this first session today. Amen. Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for your presence. We stand in awe of you today, God. We ask that your spirit would do such a precious work today. God, speak to our hearts. Anoint these lips of clay, I pray. God, open our hearts to your word. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. This lesson is something that um, I was studying one evening before church sitting up here. And then if you remember Brother Michael Barrier being here several weeks ago, did such a beautiful job in both sessions. But that morning I had read this and, man, it really struck me. And we were standing there, and he, he was obviously going to preach that morning. And I said, man, and uh, oftentimes he and I will share stuff back and forth, iron sharpeneth iron. And I mentioned to him, I said, man, I was studying this morning, and uh, I, I, I saw something. And I mentioned it to him, and he looked at me. And uh, let me back up really quick. When Brother Barrier was here, there was many a time he'd be getting ready to preach, and Sometimes there's some people that sit up here uh, that can be ornery and names not mentioned. And, and uh, you know, there's times he got to the pulpit and didn't have his notes in his Bible. And, and it was interesting to watch him dance around a little bit. So that was, that was fun. But so I mentioned to him that morning and I said, hey, I, I found something this morning. And it was out of the book of Genesis and it was speaking about these, these rivers 
And he looked at me really quick, and he looked at his notes really quick to make sure they were still in his Bible. If you remember that morning, he preached on rivers of God, and it was beautiful, and it was awesome. And he said, are you messing with me? I said, I'm not messing with you. I don't know what you're talking about. And it was just, it was an interesting uh, discussion. I had not looked at his notes. I wish I would have. I'd have taken them. But uh, that morning, it was interesting. I began to read through this, and it's been kind of churning in my spirit since then. You understand that in studying the Bible, it's, it's unbelievable the truths that you can pull out of them. When I say obscure, I'm not saying that disparagingly, but you, truths that you can pull out of obscure verses. I don't believe this is by accident. I don't believe this is by happenstance. I don't believe this is by coincidence. I don't believe that who, uh, whoever was writing the portion, in this case Moses, I don't believe that Moses got lucky. I believe that Scripture is inspired of God as holy men of God were inspired by the Holy Ghost and begin to write. And God put it in there for a reason. I enjoy studying like that, and I hope, I hope you'll ride with me for a moment this morning. But Genesis is no different. Genesis is interesting because when you begin to look at the timelines of Scripture and realize how much distance of time that Genesis covers compared to the rest of the Bible, Genesis covers, there's different schools of thought, but it definitely covered well over 2,000-year period of time just in Genesis. You would think that since Genesis was covering such a long span of time that maybe it just kind of skipped across things and it was just a very brief oversight, but don't fool yourself. We look and find so many beautiful things in Genesis. For instance, you've heard beautiful messages go across this pulpit by your pastor and others about types in creation. He did several lessons on creation. Beautiful concepts that were brought out in creation that apply to us in this day and age very thoroughly. And it's no different in our text today. We take these verses in our text, second chapter of Genesis, and the Bible says that the Lord planted a garden toward the east of a place called Eden. And we know that it was here that God placed Adam and Eve. God, God created this garden, planted this garden, which is interesting that He did. We're not going to get hung up in that, but God planted this garden. God did it. And all the other things, God spoke into existence. Let there be light. Let there be animals. Let there be birds. Let there be plants. Let there be trees. Let there be water of the seas. But God planted this garden. The term garden here refers to a hedged-in place or a protected place. And here in this perfect garden that God created, He creates this, this little place of paradise, if we can say it like that, for His most prized creation. He creates this place for Adam and Eve. He creates a place for them to be safe. He creates a place for them to dwell. This this arbor, if you want to say it like that, of every tree and every animal and, and all of these things. He made this as Adam and Eve's home. We understand that man was to grow, and the Scripture talks about man multiplying and tending this garden. And I believe that it was God's intention for this garden to grow, and for this garden to expand, and, and ultimately just to encompass, I don't believe it would bother God at all, for this garden to encompass the earth. The way he talks about it in creation, he wanted it to just be a place of dwelling for them to grow. We understand that if this is God's original plan for mankind, if I can say it like this, to take this creation and this garden and this kingdom that he had given to Adam and Eve and to expand it until it was just filling the earth, I believe that this is the exact same thing that God's intention is for us in this time of grace. We understand that the Scripture talks about us now, and we're going to get there. I'm getting a little ahead of myself to go forth and preach the gospel. Acts 1 and 8 says it like this, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. It is every intention of God that we now, with this gospel, are then to tell everyone that we can. Why? So, so this place of garden, if I can say it like that, that you and I have can expand. God would love nothing more than for this gospel to be all over this 
earth and be a place of safety for everyone that would want it. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do in this world, and God is going to help us. But in this garden, where I want to go this morning, there's this great river that flows through the garden. And this is the part that we begin to read about in our text this morning. This great river flows into Eden, and when it comes to this garden, we understand this place that God had planted, it splits into four rivers. We're given the names of all four of these branches of river. First one was Pison, and King James calls it Pison. Many call it Pishon. I'm not sure. Name of the second is Gihon. Third name uh, in modern translation is the Tigris, but we understand that it is Hittichel, which we read this morning. And then the fourth is the mighty river that still flows in this region, which is the Euphrates. So this river that splits into four heads, as the Scripture said, or four headwaters or four rivers, these four rivers stemmed from the same source. One river coming into the garden, four rivers then begin to go through this garden. This was the key. You understand that in this garden that these rivers were the key to the sustenance. We know that there was a dew that would come in the evening and and bring moisture to the plants. But when it came to sustaining Adam and Eve, when it came to sustaining the animals, and when it came to making this garden a place that was flourishing, you understand where Eden was. Everywhere else that these rivers weren't, if I can say it like that, was a barren place. Every place else that this, these, these, these rivers were not affecting was a desert place. But in this garden where these rivers were flowing, there was life and there was sustenance and, and it was taking care of them in these places. These rivers were the source of life for humanity. These rivers were the source of life for all of the animals in this place. We understand that where these rivers were, and I've already said this uh, a little bit, but where these rivers were, that the, the level of, of growth and the level uh, of life far exceeded anything else in this area. The nutrients and the constant flowing of these rivers and, and, and the fertilized soil that they, that they brought to this area created this environment for this garden. Not only that, but we read, and we're going to go there a little bit deeper in a moment, these rivers as they would flow through there. It talks about Pison. We understand that. I believe that when it talks about the precious stones and it talks about the gold where this river was, these rivers that were day in and day out flowing through these areas were uncovering these things that were buried there, uncovering the riches that were in this place. And as you grasp the importance of these rivers to the first natural creation of God, you begin to realize why the Bible is so sure to give us all of this detail. There's a reason that it's written in there. There's a re reason that it was named. There's a reason that it was broke down as it was. When you fast forward to the timeline of Jesus and you begin to read in our text in John 7, and you realize that God had Moses record these details in Genesis. You understand that all of these details were important and they were there for a reason. When he begins to stand up on that great day, as it says in John 7, on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out and says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus talks about living water, one of his favorite uh, topics, if you want to say it like that. And when he begins to talk about this, you understand, and we're just laying a foundation here, that in John 39, he wanted us to understand exactly what he was talking about. It's not a secret. It's not a mystery. In 39, it says, but this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on Him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. When Jesus is beginning to talk about living water, He's talking about the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what He's talking about. When He's talking about these rivers flowing out of you, He's talking about 
the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what he's talking about. I'm thankful today to have the Holy Ghost experience. We tend to view receiving the Holy Ghost many times as getting a cup filled up, being filled with, being filled, a vessel being filled, of which we know is happening. But you understand that when the Scripture talks about this river, it talks about it flowing. If I had to give you a title this morning, it's simply this, the rivers of God's Spirit have got to flow. You hear me? It's not just a one-time experience, and it's not just a, a, a splash, if I can say it like that. It's not just me going to a fountain to get a drink. It's not just me showing up this morning saying, fill my cup, Lord, but it is a flowing, mighty river that's got to continue to flow in my life day in and day out. Hallelujah. Rivers flowing into us, rivers flowing out of us. I don't believe it's an accident in John chapter 7 when he says, out of your belly shall flow rivers. Could have easily said, out of your belly shall flow a river of living water. I don't, I don't think it's an accident. You say, oh, that's one letter. I'm telling you, it's there for a reason. One Spirit of God flowing into you and I and rivers of living water flowing out out of us. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, I want you to know exactly where I'm headed this morning. Just like those rivers sustained life, just like those rivers brought, brought nourishment and sustained everything and made everything beautiful in the garden, that one spirit that flowed into you the day you received the Holy Ghost, there's rivers that God has intended to flow out of me and you to sustain life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just as one river that God created split into these four rivers within the garden, we understand that it is with you and I. We know, as we've already said, that they bring life, literal living water in abundance to man. And as I'm teaching through this, I want you to keep thinking about this as a river. You've you got to keep thinking that way. Because what if in the garden that these rivers were really, you know, somebody just you know, they just got a little evangelistic when they were writing it, and there's just little trickles here and there. Life's not sustained if it's not a river. He said rivers, and He meant rivers. And I pray this morning, I pray, God, please give, us, give me revelation that the Holy Ghost is not a fountain. The Holy Ghost is not a place where I come and, I, and you hear me and, and get a fix. And, and, and the Holy Ghost is not where I come and get my cup filled up. you got to catch it this morning. God intended it for, to be rivers. This Holy Ghost has got to flow through you and I. These rivers have got to flow. It was every intention of God that when we received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that from that point forward, there would be something flowing in and something flowing out on a day-to-day -day basis day in and day out, the Spirit of God would flow in my life. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God comes. It flows in our life. When the Word of God comes as a seed, we can be abundantly fruitful. We understand that in this day and age and where we're living and the way this world is right now, this place, if you haven't figured it out, is spiritually barren. There's got to be people of God. If I can say it like this, that are an oasis, that something's different. People are looking at us and they're saying, what's different about you? What's different is you see the Spirit flowing. That's the only thing they're going to be able to see is if this water is continually flowing in our life. We can go into the fact of it unearthing treasures. We understand that man is made foremost of dirt, if I can say it like that. And when the Spirit of God begins to flow, that's when our abilities and our talents and, and the gold, if I can say that, that's in people, that is absolutely in people, begins to get unearthed. And you hear me today, the only way that's going to happen is when the Spirit of God is continuing to flow. If you've ever been in, in, out and you've seen where water has flowed for a period of time, I remember as a kid going to Yosemite, 
and going up to where Vernal Falls is, and you can look at those falls, and if you look at that massive rock up there where that comes across, you can see where over time it's literally dished out water. You hear me? Water has literally dished out that raw granite that's sitting up there. Will you hear me? That's the same way I believe that the Spirit of God works in you and I. When we allow the Spirit of God to flow in our life, that's when things are unearthed and that's where things are seen. That's where where God reveals things. And I can prove this to you because when you're fresh in the Spirit, if I can say it like that, and you're prayed up and and you have have a continual prayer life and and things are going right and, and everything's, and you're hitting on all eight cylinders, if I can say it like that, and God starts working on us, and we start seeing things in us, and and God starts seeing things in us, and and sometimes it's the man of God that starts seeing things in us, because the Spirit is continually flowing in our life. And if that's not happening, those things sometimes are never seen. I've seen people that have been a part of coming to church in the house of God, for years, and their walk with God, and I'm not, I'm not speaking disparagingly, I'm just hear me for a minute, but their walk with God is a relationship where they come on a Sunday, and God touches them, and it's beautiful, and fills them up. They go away, they come back a week later, and they fill them up. And a relationship with God like that, where the Spirit is not continually flowing, there's sometimes that, the, that, that the, the value is never seen. But you let them get under the spigot, all of a sudden something changes. And the Spirit of God starts flowing in their life. I've seen this in young people. Then something starts to change. And I've seen conversations where people say, man, I have never said, I didn't know that was in them. Have you ever heard that said? I, I didn't know they had it in them. What's happening is the Spirit of God is flowing and washing things away and revealing. You hear me? We've got to have the Spirit of God, like these four rivers in the Garden of Eden, flowing at all times in our life. We understand that we are not created by accident. Every single person in this place has particular treasures and abilities and value. And if I can say it like this, that will only be uncovered by the flowing of the Spirit. We need this constant, consistent moving of the rivers of God in our life. you got to catch that. It's got to be consistent. It's got to flow. It's got to flow. It's got to flow. If you haven't caught it yet, the key is the flow of the Spirit. I, I'm telling you, getting the Holy Ghost is the most beautiful thing in the world, but it can't stop there. That's the one Spirit coming into you and filling you, and that's beautiful. But God has so much more for you and I, not just to realize that it's just a stream one time that touches us or a, a fountain one time that, that touches us, but it, God wants to flow in you day in and day out and and day after day and night after night and week after week. I'm telling you, God is hungry to see the flow of the Spirit in your life. So begin to look at the names of these rivers. Once again, you will never convince me it's by accident. Look them up and there's a classic reference, Hitchcock's Bible Names Dictionary. Sometimes when you look these things up, when you looked up just in the Hebrew or the Greek, it will say many times what, the, what it's evolved to the name meaning. But this, this, they try very hard in Hitchcock's to go with the original meaning. And the definitions of these names, there's such a correlation to what we're talking about this morning, and I need to go through them quickly. But the first one we'll go to is this word, Hittakel. And it means a sharp voice or a sound. I found one definition and I kept digging. It's just, it's almost too good to be true. I, anyway, it says rapid spiritual influx. This sharp voice, this, this sound. As you understand that Jesus taught that the Holy Ghost would come 
with a sound. When it was poured out on the day of Pentecost, there was a distinctive sign, you understand, that it would come. This sharp, distinctive voice or them speaking with other tongues, if I can say it like that. Acts 2 and 2 says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. When this thing showed up, it was with a distinct sound. It's not an accident. It's not just coincidence that these four rivers, one spirit coming in, but this hit a is this sharp sound. And there's people under the sound of my voice. You hear me today that you remember the day that God filled you with the Holy Ghost. And we know He's still doing it today. But it came with a sharp sound. It came with noise. It came with speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. This river flowing out. This was the sound thereof that Jesus had told Nicodemus would accompany those that were born of the Spirit. It's not just on the day of Pentecost. I'm going to go through this quickly, but we understand that the Samaritans received it later, this same experience. A decade later, we read where the Gentiles received this same hit of hell, if I can say it like that. We understand that we would continue and read through Paul's ministry a decade later that they would continue to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It did not stop in Bible times, but God is still pouring out the Holy Ghost today. It happened in service just the other night. Young lady standing right here powerfully received the Holy Ghost, and it was still that same sharp sound that came, one spirit coming in, but speaking in other tongues as God gave the utterance. Hallelujah. And it's not the intention of God for that to happen one time. This river is called Hittakel because it flowed. You hear me? If you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that's beautiful. But don't let anyone take it from you and say it's a one-time experience. It's every intention of God for that spirit to flow day in, day out, night after night, week after week. Don't uh, Don't ever stop. Any chance you get speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance, let it flow, let it flow, let it flow because Christ Great things happen when the Spirit is flowing. Hallelujah. It's one Spirit coming in. Four that were going out. And if it's one source coming in, you can't just walk over to one and say, you know what? I don't think this one's for this period of time. We're going to damn that one up. And now it's only three over here. You hear me? It's still the will of God that all of these would continue to flow. The second name, I'm telling you, I'll show it to you. Second name, Pison, means changing, I'm reading it in quotes, changing, semicolon, an extension of the mouth. That's what it says. The second river. So you have this this, this loud, sharp voice, this speaking in other tongues, where God comes and He takes over the tongue, the most unruly member of the body. And when God does that, He's doing it in type. And He's telling us, if I can control that tongue, I can control anything. And this second river of Pison that begins to flow is changing an extension of the mouth in type. God wants to continue Just like he changed your tongue in your mouth, he wants to change everything about you. He wants to change the way you live. He wants to change the way you talk. He wants to change the way you walk. He wants to change it. And this has got to be a continual flow. It's not just speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance, but it's something that's changing everything about you and I. And it's got to be continual. Continual changing. I don't mean to to be ugly when I say this, but there's people in here that have had the Holy Ghost probably longer than I'm alive. It never stops changing them. It doesn't stop. We never get to the place in this thing. The Spirit of God has got to continue to continually flow. I want God's Spirit to flow through me. You understand that when... You receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, we're going to talk about it for a few moments this morning. You hear me today. It's for you. God wants to do it today in this service. It's beautiful. Hallelujah. But if you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, 
when God takes that tongue over after we've repented and we've had a repentant heart and we made things right with Him, we begin to worship Him and God fills us with His Spirit and He begins to speak through us. We could not speak that. But through the power of the Holy Ghost, it begins to happen. That's exactly how God begins to change our life. He takes our life and He causes you to live in ways that you've never lived before, that, that you could not live if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost. He wants you to understand that, that what you are not able to do on your own, that through the Spirit of God and the power of God, God will allow you to do that. We've, we've talked about walking right and talking right. You say, man, I've tried that on my own. Let me just tell you something this morning. When that river flows into you and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you're going to be able to walk right and you're going to be able to talk right. You're going to be able to do things that you never thought you could do because it's the Spirit of God flowing. The third river is Pison or peace on. We understand. I apologize. Third river is Euphrates, which means that makes fruitful. It makes fruitful. You understand that there really is an ulterior motive to God's desire to change us and fill us with His Spirit. But it's a wonderful motive. God's desire is to make you and I extremely fruitful. His Spirit doesn't just come, let us have a faith-building experience, although it's beautiful. His Spirit does not just come so that we can receive His anointing, feel wonderful, feel washed, and feel renewed. It doesn't just come to make you live right, but it comes to flow through us and bless you exceedingly. This ought to be exciting to someone. I'm excited about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's beautiful. And I'm excited about the change that comes. But let me tell you what, I'm excited about the blessings of God too. I'm excited about being exceedingly blessed and fruitful. I'm excited that just like that river is going to flow when I receive the gift of the Spirit, it's also going to flow when it brings blessing to my life. You can say, uh, that's just prosperity doctrine. It's not prosperity doctrine. God wants to bless His people. God wants to do it. So this fruitful, we can talk about, it becomes so that our life is well watered, garden of the Lord. It comes to ensure, and we've already talked about this, that when the Word of God falls into our life, that this ground is fruitful and this ground can take the seed. That's what this fruitfulness is. It comes and it changes us so that we're blessed and blessed mightily. God wants to bless His people. I got a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to go on quickly. Number four is Gihon, which means in Hitchcock's, the valley of grace. Never forget that not only does the rivers of the Holy Ghost come to make us fruitful, and it comes to change us and give us a powerful experience, but it comes to save us. It comes to save us. It comes so that we can exchange living in this valley of sin. If you're here today and you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, as I've already said, if you're living in another valley today, I'm telling you there's a valley of grace that God wants you to dwell in this morning. He comes to bring us gracious gifts that we don't deserve. That's where this grace is. We don't merit, but God wants to do it. So when it comes to these rivers... Which of these four do you want flowing in your life? The correct answer, obviously, is I want all of them. I want all of them. I don't want it just to be a trickle, but I want all of them to flow in my life. I want them to flow every day in my life. I want all of them to flow in my family. I want all of them to flow in this church. I want them all to flow every single day. Hallelujah. You understand that I'm not trying, I don't think anybody thinks this, to divide God. This is one spirit, one spirit, one spirit being manifest out of us. But there's some key truths I want to look at quickly this morning. We can go through, and it's neat to study out these 
words, and it's neat to study all of this out. But if I had to come down to a key truth today, it would be this. It needs to be a continual and constant, uninterrupted flow of these rivers in our life. It's got to be continual, and it's got to be constant. you got to get a mental picture of this in your mind today, of these rivers. If you've got to close your eyes and think about it while I say this this morning, but you've got to get a mental picture of these rivers flowing through the garden of the Lord. You've got to get a picture of these rivers flowing through Eden, night and day, never stopping, continuing to flow. Rivers aren't just a trickle. They don't, they don't dry up. When you begin to think about the Mississippi River, when Brother Barry was preaching a few weeks ago, he brought this out beautifully. But you begin to think about the Mississippi and how big and how great it is. I looked up just the, 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 the mere volume of it yesterday. 4.5 million gallons per second are flowing once it gets down to New Orleans. 4.5 million gallons a second rushing mighty river flowing. I'm telling you, it's not an accident that Scripture talks about the Spirit of God flowing like a river. It's got to be a mighty torrent. It's got to be something that, that, that's flowing continually in your and I's life. It cannot just be a church experience. It cannot just be, oh, the Spirit of God moved and flowed in service last night. We've got to catch a revelation. I want the Spirit of God to flow in my home. I want the Spirit of God to flow on my job. I want the the Spirit of God to flow day in and day out. I want my kids to feel it. I want my co-workers to feel it. I, I want my friends to feel it. It's got to flow. It's not just an experience. Hallelujah. Sometimes we view the Spirit of God as a fountain, a place that we visit once a week and get filled up. I'm not poking at anybody today. I've been guilty of this. And we get busy and life goes on and we got family and we got work and we got jobs and all those things are super, super important. Many times we get caught up in that and we find ourselves, if we're really honest with ourselves, we come and it's a, in a sense, it's a water fountain experience. And I come to church, oh man, I need it. I need a touch. I need a feel. I need, I need my cup filled up. That's not what God's looking for. He's got so much more. It could be a small stream with some people. Trickle. Until revival comes, if I can say it like that. It seems like there's just this great outpouring that comes, which is right. You understand that when you think about it, when revival comes and, 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 and we have We've had great men of God through here, and it's a time of refreshing. Really, if you're really honest with yourself, it's just breaking up dams that have been just stopping the flow. It's what it is. You think about it. It's just, it's just getting to the place where the Spirit of God's flowing freely. It's flowing in services, and people start getting a revelation. It starts flowing at home, and it starts flowing at work, and, and people start asking questions, and they start getting invited to church. I'm telling you, it's just the flowing of the Spirit. That's when that refreshing comes, and, and that's when it begins to happen. But it's God's intention that this is continual in your and I's life. We understand that when it's not flowing, and I don't have time to go through all of this. I'm just going to go through some of these quickly. i got a lot of ground to cover. It could possibly be that when these aren't flowing is why there's a lack of abundant fruitfulness with the Word of God in our lives. It could be when I'm doing my daily devotion, if the Spirit of God is not flowing, Brother Booker, and unveiling stuff and helping me find stuff. It seems dry. It doesn't seem fulfilling. But when I go into it and the Spirit of God's like a wind in my sail and the Spirit of God's flowing and the Spirit of God's unearthing stuff and the Spirit of God's showing stuff, it makes all the difference in the world. Hallelujah. We've got to understand. You've got to allow the Spirit to do what it's designed to do in your and I's life. I've got to have the Holy Ghost moving in my life. I've got to. I, I've got to. 
I don't have a choice. I've got to. It's not just, it's not just a, a safety net that I can have if I want and if I decide not to and I decide to wear my seatbelt this morning, fine. And if I, No, 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 no. When it comes to the Spirit of God, I've got to have the Spirit of God flowing. I've got to have it flow this morning. I've got to have it flow this afternoon. I've got to have it flow tonight. I've got to have all of it. I've got to have Hittichel and Pison and, and Gihon and Euphrates. I've got to have all of them every single day day of my life. Hallelujah. I don't want to live without them. The second point I want to make is sin limits and stops the flow of God's Spirit in our life. You understand and you know the story well, Adam and Eve in the garden. And Adam and Eve sin against God. We find that they're removed from the garden. They're removed from blessing. I believe at that point, obviously, the rivers were still flowing, but they're on the outside looking in. They're not partaking of this blessing. We understand that the descendants of Adam become exceedingly wicked, Scripture says, and God decides to start over and bring judgment upon them with a great flood. And the flood of Noah's day, we understand, is a result of sin. The flood does more than allow God to start over, if we want to say it like that. But the flood radically changes the landscape of the entire world. It changes it. Sin changed the landscape. That's what happened. Sin changed the landscape of Eden. After the flood, even today, there's only two of the four rivers mentioned in our text that can be found. Two of them, Pison and Gihon, have disappeared completely. The other two, which is Euphrates and most likely the Tigris, they no longer come from the same source. And Euphrates, which is still flowing today, flows through what is now commonly called Baghdad. It's just basically still a desert in that area. You understand that sin changed how these rivers affected things. This isn't just true physically. This is true spiritually. What began as a fruitful garden, we understand, that was created by God for man, is now a barren desert Because these rivers stopped flowing. And you understand that when there's sin in our life, it stops the flow of these rivers. These rivers can't flow. It'll change the course of these rivers. We understand that we need the Spirit of God flowing in our life. I'm going to do everything I can to repent and make things right so that the Spirit of God could continue to flow. You understand that without these rivers in our life, what God intended in your life to be wonderful, beautiful, fruitful, something growing, something vibrant, a haven, if I can say it like that, it will become a spiritual barren desert. If the Spirit of God is not flowing, I'm telling you, there's going to be no difference between you and I and anything that's going on out there. The only difference is that when the Spirit of God flows and those rivers are flowing, it becomes an Eden. I don't know about you, but I want the Spirit of God to flow in my life. We see that there's two other places in Scripture where it talks about well-watered garden of the Lord. It's referred to in passing. I'm going to point out a couple truths concerning this, but one of the first places is in Genesis 13 and 10. It says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. And I'm going to move quickly through this this morning. But you understand that sin will always try to pass itself off as being a blessed place. Sin will always try to pass itself off that it can do the exact same thing that the well-watered gardens of God can do. 
First glance at Sodom looked like a blessed place to live when Lot looked at it. It reminded Lot, and you understand that Lot wasn't around when Eden was around. So it reminded Lot, if I can say it like this, of stories that he had heard. Had to be. It reminded Lot of what he had been told about the garden of the Lord. Lot hadn't seen the garden of the Lord, but he'd heard about it. And Lot said, that looks like the garden of the Lord. And we understand so well that it wasn't. The opportunities that Sodom offered and the experiences that it held at first seemed exactly like what Lot was missing in his life. You hear me today. Lot thought that's what he needed. It looks like the garden of the Lord, that's where I need to go. But we understand that what it was missing wasn't in Sodom. Lot was so very wrong. You understand that when we go to other places and try to fill what only the Spirit of God can fill, it won't be long that the Sodom's well-watered plains are burnt crisp, covered in sulfur and salt. That's what happened with Lot. The world's the exact same way, if I can say it like that this morning. It claims to have everything you need to fill all those longings. It can take care of everything. It's got every answer. Just, just ask somebody. It can take care of it. You got problems? The world can take care of it. You can drink it away if you'd like. You can drug it away if you'd like. You can, you can psychiatrist, psychologist it away if you'd like. And I'm not disparaging those, but I'm just telling you, the world will tell you that it's got all of your answers. And I'm just going to be blunt with you this morning. Until you hit the rivers of God and the Spirit of God flowing, nothing can take care of it like the Spirit of God can. If you've tried those things this morning and you're frustrated today, you're in the right place. Not because I'm up here teaching today, but because there's a God that wants to pour out His Spirit today and answer every single question that you got today. We need to move quickly today. The final truth I want to talk about. You can stand with me this morning as our musicians come. Is God can reverse the curse of sin. And this is the most beautiful thing. And cause a desert place to spring forth as a well-watered garden. Isaiah 51 says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, and ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit which ye were digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, and he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Did you catch that this morning? Did you catch the promise that God gave us? Maybe you've let some things block some rivers in your life. Maybe, maybe you walked away for a little while. Maybe you haven't been in the place that you need to be. You hear me this morning. That scripture tells us that those that will pursue righteousness and right living, those who will seek God and look to trust Him, those will be comforted and the Lord will make your wilderness a garden. All we have to do is turn to Him. All we have to do is say, okay, God, I want to make some things right. I want to live righteous. That's what it says. I want to live holy. I want to follow you. I want the river of God to flow in my life. This is not just a promise in Isaiah that is natural. We understand this is absolutely spiritual. God will reverse the driest, driest desert in this place today. I don't care where you've gone and where you've walked and where you've been. God will reverse it in your life. You say, well, man, I've lost so much time. That's okay. God will make your barren desert a very beautiful garden this morning. Hallelujah. 
You say, what about all that time I've lost? That's all right. Let the Spirit begin to flow and begin to reveal the treasures that God still has in your life. I'm telling you, God still has got something great for you in your life. God still wants to do beautiful things in your life this morning. And I just want to tell somebody this, and I'm done, that these rivers that I'm talking about this morning, if you're here today, I've already said it, but you hear me, and you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost. When he was talking in John chapter 7, that's exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about, then he was talking about a day coming. But let me just tell you, it's beautiful. That day is here. God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost this morning. And when it happens, you'll begin to speak with other tongues. There's one river. And once you begin to speak with other tongues, then God wants to take it further than that. Not only does he want to take control of your tongue, he wants to change your life. And he'll do it. Hallelujah. And God doesn't want to stop there this morning. There's another river. Hallelujah. He wants to begin to make your life fruitful. He wants to make your life beautiful. He wants to make it a beautiful garden. And all of this are wrapped up into one river. It says God wants to let you dwell in the valley of grace. Hallelujah. Are you thankful for the Spirit of God today? Do you want it to flow day in and day out in your life? Oh, let's love him right now as they come. Hallelujah. Let it flow today, Jesus.